Welcome to uh, class 16 on topics in power electronics and distributed generation. Uh, we have been talking about uh, active anti islanding in the class and uh, last time we looked at the relationship between uh, power and voltage uh, and uh, we modeled the feeder as a parallel RLC resonant circuit uh, and uh, looked at the relationship between power and voltage and then how you could add power voltage characteristics to cause the voltage to have not a stable operating point, but can actually go out of the nominal range. Then we started looking at the reactive power versus uh, frequency relationship and we, uh, um, we are able to uh, get a relationship. This should be uh, uh, the relationship between reactive power. So, this is Q. the relationship between reactive power and frequency uh, related to uh, your quality factor, power and frequency. And at the nominal 50, 50 hertz, your uh, power of the uh, injected by the DG is 0. Uh, and we saw that if your uh, frequency deviates by delta F, say if, uh, reduces by delta F, then your reactive power drawn by the load would increase by delta Q. Uh, if your frequency increases by delta F, your the power drawn by the load would, uh, would reduce by uh, uh, amount of uh, again some delta Q load, but with a negative polarity. Okay. Then we looked at what would happen if you had uh, variations in L and C around the nominal values. And uh, uh, if uh, your uh, essentially your Q of your load increases, that would correspond to the situation where your L reduces. So, drawing more reactive power or uh, C also reduces. So, this would correspond to then a situation where your, your resonant frequency will now settle down to a higher value. Uh, or uh, the, on the other side, if your uh, Q load changes in a, a polarity uh, where your uh, Q reduces, that would correspond to L prime uh, going to L plus delta L and some C prime being C plus delta C. And the corresponding resonant frequency that it would settle down to is at, at a lower value. Okay. And if you look at what would be the, uh, the operating point with the nominal reactive power being 0 output from the DG that would be essentially a flat line. And uh, you could look at then what would be the final uh, operating frequency depending on what the uh, final resonant frequency of that particular system is. Then you could look at what is uh, uh, the next sit situation. Here we looked at where the there is variation in L and C around the nominal value. You could then look at what would happen if uh, your there is a change in reactive power from the DG. And here what we are assuming is that the, uh, the DG power uh, variation is modeled as an equivalent LC uh, load variation. And essentially if uh, once your uh, upstream switch opens in the in on the on the feeder then essentially under that condition after switch s1 opens you have your q load is equal to q dg uh, because there is uh, no delta q coming in at that particular point from the model of the system that you are trying to analyze uh, so Q load is what is being consumed and Q dg is what is being uh, sourced at the dg point. And if your dg operating uh, Q shifts by a value of uh, delta uh, Q dg, so this would be your original value and if it shifts up, then essentially you could think of it as uh, uh, 
now operating at a equivalent uh, uh, as a equivalent load with uh, uh, what we saw was it would be L minus delta L or C minus delta C. So, you would settle down at a higher operating frequency. So, uh, similarly if you have a drop in reactive power then essentially your operating frequency would actually come down to a lower value. Uh, so, it is possible to uh, shift the operating frequency of your island based on uh, uh, adjusting the amount of reactive power that you are uh, injecting from your DG. Okay. So, if you look at it uh, 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 from a way on what you would do to uh, destabilize the feeder, uh, you could link your uh, reactive power to a change in frequency that is measured at the DG. Okay. So, essentially what you do is change your output of your d g with some gain times q, q quality factor power operating frequency with delta f. So, you could think of uh, essentially your block diagram as under nominal conditions q d g command would be 0. and you could measure the frequency and pass it through a, a, a high pass filtered or a washout network to get uh, uh, the change in frequency and you can link that with k q f and provide this and depending on the, uh, the type of DG that you have whether it is a, a synchronous machine or a, or a inverter you could link it to the exciter. So, in a synchronous machine you can control your output war by adjusting the excitation level in a power converter you would can control the amount of uh, uh, reactive power output by controlling your quadrature axis current which your in phase current would correspond to real power your quadrature co axis current would correspond to the reactive power. So, by linking in a manner uh, in this particular manner you could think of shifting the operating frequency. So, the idea is if you have a disturbance which would cause say your frequency to lower. So, as an example if you have a case where your frequency dip, dips then essentially what you do is you lower the, the war output from your uh, D, DG. and the lowered uh, war output from the DG would cause a further uh, uh, dip in your frequency and this uh, is further measured in uh, measured at your sensing point leading to further reduction in frequency and essentially your system uh, your operating frequency goes out of bound. Okay. 
So, one thing that uh, you can see in uh, uh, this particular uh, 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 analysis that we did for your fe feeder uh, along with the distributed uh, DG source in a case where you have unintentional islanding is that uh, and compare it with what you expect from a uh, traditional uh, power systems analysis book. Uh, in a traditional power systems analysis book, the link is between power and frequency and between voltage and reactive power. Uh, so, whereas that is not the case in what we have analyzed so far. Uh, the, re, uh, the main reason is that the model that we take for the feeder is different from the model that is considered typically in past systems analysis. Uh, if you look at the large transmission systems, the large generators, uh, the, the major portion of the loads in uh, power system is actually machine loads. Um, uh, more than 60 percent of the power consumed actually goes into large motors. Okay. So, uh, if you look at that, the model in that particular case is uh, a machine with large inertia. So, there the link is between the energy and speed of the machine, uh, where the model is the uh, of the power going to accelerate or decelerate the, the inertia. And then the other thing is that you look at the lines, the equipment, they are predominantly inductive. Uh, so, you have say tra transition lines with high x by r ratios. So, you can consider that to be primarily uh, inductive. So, uh, in a situation such as that, the link would be different from what you get in the model of a feeder, where we have taken the model of the feeder to be a, a parallel RLC resonant uh, load. Okay. But overall, the objective in uh, the case where we are trying to detect an unintentional island is uh, to make your operating point unstable. So, if you have say uh, 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 your voltage amplitude versus time, and at some particular instant. T naught say uh, your upstream switch open. So, the idea is to have a destabilizing term such that your voltage goes out of bound. So, you have a V high or a V low which would be the thresholds at which your DG would uh, detect and disconnect and depending on whatever it is, you look at the ability of your anti-islanding anti algorithm to be able to detect in a short duration that your voltage has gone out of bound. Or if you have frequency, you are looking at your frequency versus time, you have say a nominal frequency and at T naught, uh, you, your upstream switch disconnected and then you have a f high or a f low and depending on when depending on when you are uh, able to detect that the frequency went out of bound you uh, can trigger the relay at your DG uh, source that uh, something has your, your nominal condition has gone beyond uh, uh, your range, your operating condition has gone beyond acceptable range. So, the DG has to disconnect and this duration that you typically have is uh, less than 2 seconds because you want to be able to detect that uh, unintentional island has occurred before uh, upstream recloser uh, uh, Recloses, so you want this detection to happen fairly quickly. Okay. So, so the disconnection can happen anywhere upstream of the on the feeder, and the DG can be anywhere located anywhere along the feeder. After the disconnection, 
uh, the, uh, the unit which is actually making the detection of uh, whether it is an islanded situation or not is detecting its voltage at locally it is not able to detect at some other point. So, it is taking that measurement on a local basis and be, uh, based on the local measurement it is making a decision whether to stay connected or uh, or to disconnect. So, in literature there, there are a variety of uh, uh, algorithms that people have looked at, uh, methods that people have looked at for both uh, passive and uh, active anti islanding. Uh, we looked at under and over voltage, uh, under over frequency. Uh, we also looked at uh, reverse power flow based detection. People have looked at other methods such as uh, power factor change. Uh, rate of change of power, rate of change of frequency, whether there is a sudden phase jump on uh, in your system, whether there is a large imbalance that is happening uh, on in the in terms of the voltage, whether uh, there is a increase in THD that is being measured. Uh, so, so some of the, these methods would be considered uh, passive because here you are just observing Whereas, in the active methods you are trying to introduce uh, changes such as actively trying to change your operating frequency uh, or change your power level or voltage level etcetera. So, it goes by a variety of names, but uh, uh, I, uh, you now have a feel for what is the underlying principle that people are trying to adopt. Essentially, you are trying to take a op stable operating point and make it unstable. so that uh, your uh, your uh, your actual voltage is uh, is measured and if you see that your power levels or voltage amplitudes or frequency goes out, out of bound that would correspond to a situation of uh, unintentional island uh, also you there are always uh, advantages and disadvantages for many of these uh, schemes and uh, to find improved methods for detecting an unintentional island is a uh, area of active research. So, one thing that uh, you would have seen is that uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, detecting uh, and responding to a fault on your feeder and uh, uh, if you are uh, for, for a variety of reasons you would need to disconnect from your feeder and you would need to do that uh, fairly quickly. Okay. And, uh, couple of primary reasons would be uh, to disconnect from the grid for protection coordination. Protection and coordination. Also, uh, to prevent uh, formation of unintentional island. And uh, there is another reason why uh, you would like to uh, disconnect uh, rapidly from the grid and this is where you want to operate as a uh, intentional island. Okay. So, this is primarily for power quality uh, reasons. So, So, if your grid power quality is uh, poor for some reason 
and your switching speed is slow, it means that your load is now exposed to that poor power quality for a longer duration. So, if you can rapidly disconnect uh, from the grid, it means that the duration of poor power quality seen uh, by the load can be reduced by a faster switch. Okay. And if you look at then a traditional uh, electromechanical circuit breaker, your operating duration is uh, 2 to 5 cycles uh, and that would be considered uh, instantaneous. So, the fastest uh, disconnection might be of the order of uh, multiple cycles. Uh, whereas, if you look at uh, semiconductor based switch, you could switch in a much, much faster manner uh, in less than a cycle. Okay. Whereas, if you look at a semiconductor based switch, So, if you look at then a situation where uh, you have uh, uh, the grid uh, potential uh, distributed generation source and uh, then uh, switch which can connect or disconnect, then you have two possibilities. Okay. So, you could have the grid So, you might for, from a power quality perspective you might be uh, uh, nominally normally under normal condition you might be connected to the uh, uh, to the grid and if you have uh, a situation where your grid power quality is poor or the grid goes away you have a blackout essentially you want to switch over uh, and connect to a DG. Okay. Then in terms of uh, operation of the DG for power quality uh, perspective, there are two possible ways in which you could operate your DG. Uh, you could have say a cold standby. Uh, which means that uh, your DG is uh, de-energized and it needs to start up before. Uh, so, nominally the grid voltage is there. If you need to change over, first you need to start up your, uh, your, your source before you can actually transfer over to the source. And this would be typically the way you would run a diesel generator set. And if you look at uh, uh, the startup time of uh, gen set, you can take uh, 20 uh, seconds for a really fast gen, uh, startup gen set to minutes for something which might need a little bit more warm up time to actually start up and stabilize to a normal operating condition. So, one possibility is uh, uh, in response to the grid power quality being poor, you then sh start up a gen set, then the duration of outage seen by the load would be longer of the order of then 20 seconds to a minute depending on what is your startup time. Uh, another way of uh, running it would be a hot standby. And if you look at uh, essentially a situation such as that, it means that your voltage over here is available over all the time. So, that would correspond to a situation where for example, you could uh, have the machine spinning at uh, under no load or it could be uh, a, a, a UPS which uh, because the power loss in a UPS can be much smaller compared to the power loss in a genset, your, your UPS is always having 
uh, output voltage or uh, many UPSs can actually start up in a much shorter duration uh, depending on how quickly you can uh, uh, start up your, uh, your inverter. Uh, so, that would correspond to a hot standby uh, basis which means that essentially you have voltage available uh, and uh, in this particular case the speed with which you are uh, able to transfer over is then entirely limited by the speed of the switch. Okay. So, here you are not waiting for a DG to start up, if your switch is faster you can actually transfer over in a much faster manner. So, if you look at uh, power quality applications, So, use of electromechanical uh, and uh, semiconductor based transfer switches are, uh, are commercially uh, available solutions. Okay. So, there are commercial uh, transfer switches that are both solid state and uh, electromechanical. So, then if you look at uh, uh, a semiconductor based uh, switch what you uh, and compare it with say uh, 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 electromechanical switch then you can look at what would be your advantage uh, and what would be the penalty that uh, you would have. So, you can look at uh, And if you look at uh, the speed, definitely the electromechanical switch is much faster. If you look at the number of uh, cycles, your semiconductor based uh, switch can operate a uh, much larger number of uh, uh, times compared to uh, 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 mechanical uh, circuit breaker because after uh, uh, given number of operations maybe 10,000, 20,000 cycles you might have to uh, uh, look, look at your springs and do servicing of your breaker whereas uh, your semiconductor based switch can operate uh, uh, for millions of cycles and without uh, much degradation. Then if you look at uh, the, uh, the other uh, aspects you look at uh, power loss, the power loss in a, a semiconductor based switch is much higher because of uh, conduction loss on state drops etcetera. So, your electromechanical switch is actually more attractive from a power loss perspective. Uh, if you look at it in terms of uh, electrical rugged, ruggedness. Uh, your electromechanical switch can take much more abuse in terms of uh, surge current, surge voltages etcetera comp compared to uh, uh, semiconductor based uh, device. So, uh, there is definitely advantage of electromechanical compared to the semiconductor based uh, switch in terms of electrical ruggedness. Cost definitely the semiconductor based switch is actually much 
going to be much more expensive. So, there are trade offs. So, uh, you can see uh, cost is an important factor for uh, many commercial uh, applications. So, if you are willing to pay the cost, it means that your load has some definite uh, advantage by the improvement in power quality that the electro the semiconductor base switch can provide. Uh, just if there was no net overall cost advantage, then there would not be an incentive to go for a semiconductor base switch. Okay. So, then in terms of uh, the semiconductors, you could then look at uh, uh, what are the possible semiconductors. If you look at the, the earliest uh, 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 devices that were available uh, in solid state, uh, th those would be the power diodes, the SCRs, the thyristors. So, the SCR or uh, the silicon control rectifier would be an early device that was that's, uh, that has been available since the 1960s. So, comparatively compared to other devices, it is a mature technology. Okay. Compared to uh, 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 IGBTs, transistors etcetera, uh, it has much higher uh, surge current rating. Uh, so, if you look at the peak to nominal current rating of a SER, it would be higher, much higher than that of an IGBT. Uh, also, if you look at in terms of uh, the on state drop, which has an implication for power loss, the on state drop of an SER is actually lower than that of a typical transistor. So, of similar rating. So, uh, a SER based uh, trans, uh, semiconductor switch has been some of the thing uh, a, a, a particular technology that people have looked up uh, looked at for uh, for now quite quite a while. Okay. So, if you look at uh, SER, So, it is uh, 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 it can be thought of as a switch where to turn on you uh, you apply a pulse between your gate and the cathode. Uh, when you have positive voltage uh, across the anode and cathode, then the device would turn on. Uh, a SCR cannot turn off by itself. Okay. So, you need an external circuit to turn it off. Uh, in an AC system, you have uh, voltages going through uh, zero, uh, your currents going through zero crossings. So, you have uh, points where your currents go through zero and you could make use of that to actually stop conduction uh, within say a cycle or so and uh, for turning off you would uh, need to keep your current in the SCR to be below the holding current of the device for a duration greater than its uh, turn off duration and uh, with no gate pulses applied. Okay. So, that would be what is required to turn off the device. And after it is off, to turn it back on, you have to apply a gate cathode voltage uh, pulse when you have positive uh, anode to cathode voltage. And so, what we mentioned was a SCR has higher surge current capab capability. So, if you uh, look at the higher power uh, 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 SERs, they are commonly available in what is called as a press pack packages. So, essentially uh, 
the press pack packages have a uh, couple of advantages that uh, are beneficial. One is uh, it is possible to have very high current uh, uh, current devices. So, press pack package is essentially what is uh, like a, a plate, a, 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 a cylindrical plate if, uh, uh, and essentially now one side would be your anode, the other side would be your cathode and you would have leads for gate and cathode that is coming in from the side. So, uh, to hold a press pack devices, device in place, you apply pressure on the top and the bottom and uh, now that would mean that you have uh, uh, conduction of power loss from two directions compared to one direction for a traditional uh, uh, say uh, IGBT module that is mounted on a heat sink. So, your thermal resistances can there can be advantages in terms of thermal resistances. Also, because you are applying pressure from uh, the top and bottom of such a device, uh, you the fail a failed device would typically fail short, uh, because uh, any failure would cause the device the local junction to get damaged and the damaged junction would essentially then uh, short between your anode and cathode. Whereas, in a module type of device, uh, the modules are connected with wire bonds and if uh, for some reason the module ruptures, then there is a possibility that the uh, rupture can cause uh, the failed module to fail open, in which case you can have a failure that can either be short circuit or open circuit in case of a, a, a heat sink mounted module, whereas in a press pack package when you have failure it is uh, typically a short circuit, which means that now if you have uh, a device that fails, you can have a series connection of couple uh, multiple devices and you can have redundancy uh, because the failed device is short, the next device can al alwe always be used to actually control. So, for many high power applications where uh, redundancy is an important uh, concern, you could then con uh, consider a press pack package uh, which will give you uh, benefits. Uh, one disadvantage of uh, the SCR compared to something like uh, the modern day uh, uh, IGBT is that SCRs need snubbers for protection. So, you have DVDT snubbers. Uh, to prevent uh, spurious uh, triggering uh, uh, spurious turn on. Also you have uh, you need over voltage protection if there is a surge voltage to prevent that surge voltage from triggering inadvertently triggering your SCR you need uh, voltage protection. Also you need uh, DIDT protection because once you turn on if suddenly a current large current flows through a device in a rapid manner you can have current crowding, overheating of and formation of hot spots and that can lead, lead to damage of the device. So, you, you with SCRs you would need to use uh, snubbers for its uh, operation. Okay. An example of uh, SCR based transfer switch is shown over here. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is shown is uh, essentially a single line diagram of a transfer switch and uh, you have two sources, the first source might be considered a prime source. So, under norm normal conditions your power flow would be from your prime source, when uh, the prime source for some reason if the power qual quality becomes poor you go you switch over to a secondary or an alternate source. Uh, 
and uh, you have in typical uh, transfer switches you might also have some additional switches for normal operation and for bypass operation. For example, under normal operation uh, your, uh, your switch uh, S 1 n, S 2 n and S 3 n would be on. and your bypass switches S 1 B, S 2 B would be off and whether your power is flowing from source 1 or source 2 depends on which set of thyristors you are triggering. Okay. Uh, you might have a bypass operation where S 1 n, S 2 n, S 3 n is off and S 1 B or S 2 B is on depending on uh, which source you want to bypass to. Okay. So, you might make use of this bypass switches to Say for example, if you want to repair your main SCRs and still uh, provide uh, power to your critical load or you want to do some modifications on your alternate source, uh, uh, you might typically operate it in a bypass mode and then uh, uh, ensure that uh, your whatever servicing repairs etcetera occurs during a bypass mode and under normal mode you are able to switch between your prime source or your alternate source. And uh, if you look at uh, what the this uh, arrangement is trying to do, under normal conditions your power flow would be from V1. So, your S 1 F and S 1 I R would be triggered under normal condition and if for some reason the power quality at V1 becomes poor, if the voltage uh, drops or if it gets, gets too distorted or if the uh, some parameter goes out of the acceptable range for the critical load, then you want to shift over to V2. Okay. And there are a few methods for shifting over to V2. So, So, methods of transfer, one is uh, called open transition in open transition essentially it means that uh, uh, to transfer from one source to the other first you open both the switches and, uh, uh, and then there wait for a small delay to ensure that the switches are uh, perfectly open. Then you turn on the switch to which uh, uh, to which you want to transfer to. Okay. So, here you are having a break before make operation and here the delays can be longer and the power uh, poorer voltage would be seen by the load for a uh, longer duration. Okay. The other possibility is a closed transition. In a closed transition essentially you turn on both the switches first 
and then you turn off the switch you want the source which you want to disconnect from ok. So, here this is make before break and here if the, the voltage of the sources are not well matched then there is a possibility for surge, surge currents between your two sources. So, so it would uh, the closed transition will not work under all situations or you might end up trip, tripping a breaker or some other switch ok. Also you could have say uh, uh, something like a forced transition where if you have a primary source and an alternate source and your alternate source can be controlled and uh, it can be controlled in such a manner that you could uh, make use of the voltage and current capability of your alternate source to actively force commutate your outgoing SCR then you could have a transition in a shorter time frame ok. So, if you look at a uh, uh, typical situation you might uh, use a combination of say uh, uh, of these methods for example, uh, when you are going from prime to alternate. you might use uh, open transition because uh, the prime to alternate transition is because you might have a, a, a outage in the main power. So, if you do a closed transition you will have a, a, a surge of power between your two sources, but when you go from alternate to prime you might have a closed transition which means that uh, now your grid has returned back to normal and you want to turn off from your alternate source and return back to the grid because now both are in the nominal range you can actually connect the two sources together without having a big uh, surge current and then uh, with minimal disturbance to the load you can actually achieve the transfer. Also you could think about uh, an, a situation where you have a uh, 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 possibility of uh, making use of uh, one source to commutate the second source. So, say if the load is, load is uh, at unity power factor. So, it, if you assume it is a resistive load and uh, V 1 and V 2 are in phase, then you could think about say if you are operating in the positive half cycle of the voltage and if uh, uh, under that particular uh, condition if the prime source voltage went away because of an outage. then uh, essentially your if you look at the switch that would be conducting under that condition it would be S 1 F. It is a positive half cycle S 1 F is conducting current 
because the resist uh, load is unity power factor. So, this voltage has say gone down to 0 and now this voltage is also in phase which means that this is also seeing a positive voltage. So, if you can turn on S 2 F then you could uh, reverse the apply a negative bias to your thyristor S 1 F and be able to turn off uh, the thyristor by making use of your alternate source. So, in this particular manner you could actually get uh, faster transitions and then you could look at uh, uh, what would be the worst case scenario, what would be the maximum delay possible. And typically what uh, uh, people have seen is that uh, with, uh, 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 with a transfer switch you can have uh, a quarter cycle delay. So, people uh, talk about uh, a transfer switch of uh, quarter cycle uh, trans, uh, quarter cycle speed. Okay. And a challenge in, uh, in many of this transfer switch is to differentiate when to transfer and when not to transfer uh, because uh, you can have many false trips. Uh, for example, you might have some small phase jump or some smaller amplitude changes or some harmonics which might be acceptable. So, how to make a decision when to transfer and when not to transfer that is actually a challenge uh, in uh, transfer in such a configuration. Okay. So, when do you need to definitely make a decision to go across and when not to because if you are thinking about a large load you are thinking about transferring a, a large amount of power from one source to another source. So, uh, there are consequences of shifting large amounts of power and you do not want to minimize the number of uh, false changeovers. The, the third uh, requirement of such a transfer switch is that uh, uh, you have a switch where uh, you, you al always have the possibility that you might have a uh, short circuit in your load and your switches have to be able to handle the, the high current levels uh, when your load itself ha has a failure which means that the switch should be capable of handling not just the nominal load current, but also the short circuit currents that the load might on encounter even if it is for a limited duration of maybe one cycle or a two cycle, uh, the, the semiconductor should not get damaged in that short duration. So, uh, so, uh, so designing these uh, transfer switches are quite uh, challenging. People, if you look at the design of uh, uh, a transfer switch, uh, you have two sources. If you then look at, uh, uh, people also talk about static breakers.
here you do not now do not have an alternate source to help with your commutation which means that it is uh, even more challenging your duration and delays might be uh, longer than quarter cycle it can be one, one to two cycles. So, uh, configuration of uh, a, a semiconductor based uh, uh, circuit breaker is shown over here where you have uh, the semiconductor based breaker with switches for normal operation and a switch for bypass operation depending on how you want to operate your system. And uh, again one main concern in uh, the system is uh, uh, how to handle the, the peak requirements, the peak, uh, 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 peak in terms of how to handle the fault current requirements and also the, the continuous uh, power loss that would happen in the semiconductor device when it is uh, operating under normal conditions. People have also looked at hybrid approaches of trying to combine both uh, electromechanical and semiconductor based uh, 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 switches to minimize your power loss, but have the rapid disconnection capability. Uh, so, there are a, a variety of approaches such as this uh, that are available, uh, but uh, again you have the issue of uh, handling the, the, the power required, the peak power which would then reflect back in terms of the junction power loss and uh, also the increased cost of now having just a simple breaker now being replaced by a, a more complicated system consisting of semiconductors plus the other switches for normal operation different modes of operation. So, in an example such as this you could have a semiconductor based breaker and you have the main grid coming in. So, in, in case there is a poor power quality or the need for detection of an unintentional island on the feeder, then you can rapidly disconnect from the grid using a semiconductor based switch. Your DG would then continue to provide power to your critical loads. Uh, you might have some secondary loads which are not that important which uh, you might be able to say it can actually have a blackout or a outage but you might have some important loads which are critical which you want to ensure that it stays up even when the power quality goes down. So, uh, so this also shows an example configuration where you are using a DG uh, not just for providing power to the, to the main grid exporting power, but also then simultaneously to provide uh, power quality for your critical uh, loads in your facility. So, for references related to uh, these issues, uh, you have IEEE standard 1547. Uh, so, here th this is a recommended standard, uh, it is just a recommendation, it is not enforceable, but then you have similar uh, uh, issues that are show in things like uh, UL 1741, which is a underwriter lab uh, sta uh, standard. So, if you need a UL seal on your equipment which is required for maybe financing etcetera, you would need to meet that particular standard. So, many times recommended standards become uh, indirect financial incentives to actually uh, follow and uh, achieve that particular target. Uh, this is uh, a, 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 a one reference which is available from the general electric website on relaying. So, many of these issues reflect back on relaying also you have the journal articles on unintentional islanding thank you